First, let's define a formal language. And the term formal really means to be very formal in the mathematical strict sense. So we talk here about an alphabet sigma, which is a set of letters. So for example, we have sigma to be out of the set of 0 and 1, or sigma to be a up to z in terms of those different characters. So similar to the alphabet that you write, you can now form words over the alphabet by putting together those individual letters and a word or a set of words over an alphabet sigma is usually denoted as sigma star, where star indicates any number of repetition of those letters. Now a formal language L over an alphabet sigma is a subset of sigma star, so such that means it's a set of words over the alphabet. So similar to the English language, which is a language, a formal language L also is a subset of an alphabet. So you can really see the analogies between speech and between programming language and so forth. So that's really similar. So how do we create or define a formal language? So we can define L to be a set such as saying L is the words he, she, it, or we can use some prose definition like saying L binary are all the binary numbers and L ing are all the English words according to a dictionary for example. We can use a recursive definition using generative rules of a grammar which is, has a lot of similarity to EBNF, so the extended Bacchus Nava form that we looked at. And we really come back to those ideas in this lecture and closing the arc. So lastly, the string matched, for example, by a regular expression or as all the strings that are accepted by a finite automaton. So why are formal definitions preferable compared to prose definitions? Well, the advantage of using a regular expression, a finite automaton or a recursive definition is that you can use the computer to check if a word is element of L. Yeah? And hereby I want to cite there is a complexity of languages. So some languages are more complex than others and they are defined in the so-called Chomsky hierarchy and we will have a quick glance over this concept. The advantage is that when the more simple the language is, it can be checked faster and you can use easier concepts to actually match and identify if the word is element of this language. For example, have a look at this language he, she, it. So it just constitutes of three words. It's very easy to check for it. No big deal to write a program and you should be able to do it with your C knowledge today, pretty much. Yeah? We are here more talking about languages that are infinite in terms of the number of words. Yeah? In German, for example, you can have a word where you concatenate different uh, subjects or also nomens together. Like you can say something like um, water treadmill. Instead of being three words or two words, it's going to be one word. And you can add more and more things yeah, to it like um, a German water treadmill and so on and so forth. Okay, so this here are now a couple of slides that are not necessarily for you to recall, but they are here for your reference and we will practice them a little bit. Then, okay, what is a grammar? We remember a grammar is one way of describing generative rules similar to EBNF which define our language. So a grammar is a four element tuple G, G for grammar, which consists of N, which is the non-terminal symbols, sigma, which is the set of terminal symbols, which are different from N, the non-terminals, P, which are the production rules, and S, which is the start symbol for the production rules. Okay, and we have looked particularly at the production rules, and they are again similar to the E, B, and F. So what does the production rule do? It maps variables to a string element of 
where you take one of the non-terminals or one of the terminal symbols, arbitrary many of them. Okay, so you you start with the start symbol, and then now you must apply production rules until you get a valid word that is just element of this finite set of terminal symbols, similar to EBNF. So a derivation is the application of our production rules from our start symbol. There can be different many derivations to obtain the same word and we denote L of G to be the language generated by grammar G. And as we said the complexity of languages depend on the nature of our production rules pretty much. That is now a new information. So they do not depend on N. So regardless how big the set of non-terminals is, regardless how big the set of terminal symbols is, it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is the production rules and there how they are pretty much designed, how they look like. Okay, And this is, as we will see, defined in the, pro in the Chomsky hierarchy. So here is now an example grammar. The language of all valid parentheses. Okay, so for example here we have an opening and closing bracket, that is a valid, we c I would say a valid parenthesis. Yeah, so how do we define it? Well, we have G is N, sigma P and S. N is, we, we just need the symbol S, which is the same as the start symbol. Then we say sigma, well it's, as this language just covers all parentheses, well it's just the opening and closing um, parenthesis pretty much. So next we have our production rules. So S can generate the opening and closing bracket. S can generate opening, it generates S again and closing, or S can generate S and another S symbol. Okay, so now these are three production rules. So we have P is a set of three rules, those three rules. And now whenever we see our starting symbol S, we have to apply those three rules until at the end we get only terminal symbols, which are these two. So with those production rules, we can now generate arbitrary valid set of parentheses. Um, and what is valid parentheses? Well, it means, well, you have a number of opening and closing parentheses that is identical. And always when you generate an opening one, you will later find the closing one. Okay, never you find a closing one and then an opening one, that doesn't make sense, yeah? So let's have a look for one possible derivation for our start symbol, for our string S, which looks like this. We have the opening, closing, then opening, opening, closing, closing. Okay, and he, now we, we have to apply the individual steps. So first we start with our start symbol S. Now we derivate it using this last rule to SS. Then the first S gets derivated to opening and closing, which is rule one. Then the, we, we are done with this one. They're just terminals, you cannot apply further rules. Next, the second S, you apply the second rule. So opening bracket, closing bracket, and S. So this string gets replaced with those three. And lastly, this string gets replaced with the rule number one again. And now you got this set of parentheses. Actually this is so-called context-free grammar. 